hey welcome back everyone in this video we will talk about interest rates now interest rate they are central to finance there are many financial products that actually rely on interest rates for example derivative products such as swap which requires interest rate for their valuation we also have fras that is forward rate agreements which in itself has the underlying as the interest rate and also there's a futures contract which is known as interest rate futures which is also dependent upon interest rate so we cannot neglect the importance of interest rate and knowing about interest rates and uh, different categories or different types of interest rates how they are actually measured and analyzed is what we will look throughout the videos now all right and let me also tell you that this reading uh, reading number 40 the properties of interest rate this is from financial markets and product book which is book number three and there's also a separate topic that is reading number 54 this is also about the interest rates and this is from the book valuation and risk models which is book number four now there are two separate chapters on interest rates uh, and at the same time both these chapters they share uh, similar learning objectives as well as there are many material that are overlapping in between these two chapters so what i thought is that let's do both these chapters simultaneously rather than taking one by one okay that would make more sense and before we start this is our whatsapp number and this is our official email id in case you have any queries or if you want any guidance all right feel free to contact us okay so what is interest rate now to put it simply an interest rate is the return the amount of money that you earn for lending the money so let's say that i am an investor and i have opened a fixed deposit in a particular bank so the return that i will make in this particular fixed deposit for a period of time is seven percent okay so this seven percent is the interest rate and this is the return that i will make on my investment so interest rate put it simply is the amount of return or the percentage return that you earn for lending the money right pretty simple now we look at the categories or the different types of interest rate that exist in the financial markets the very first one we have is the government borrowing rates now it's very essential to know that one of the most important interest rate is that paid by the government on their own borrowings okay so here let's say that the government has issued these bonds to these different investors for a particular period of time and this five percent is the interest rate which the government will pay to these investors okay so basically this five percent becomes the cost of borrowing to the government okay so this is known as the government borrowing rates and in the u.s this is referred to as treasury rates now as a student of finance you will come across treasury rates a lot of time okay and there are three important uh, treasuries that we have uh, the one is the treasury bills and the second one is a treasury notes and the third one is the treasury bonds okay now these are the three things that you will come across a lot and we're going to be discussing about these things in details in the later videos but just understand that there are three different types of treasury in instruments as well so for a different maturities over time okay now the thing to note here is that the government borrowing rates they are considered to be risk free rates why is the case because it is considered highly unlikely that the government of a developed country will actually default on debt issued in its own currency because a government can always create more currency to meet its obligation and that is the reason why we call these as risk-free rates okay so this is important and something to note all right moving on from the government rates to the next category which is repo rates the repo get its name from repurchase agreements okay so the repo or repurchase they are one and the same so basically repos are an agreement uh, in which you post the collateral such as you post uh, uh, stocks or bonds or any government security and then you agree to repurchase these securities at some time in the future okay so let's take a, a simple example 
to understand the repos so let's say that at day zero uh, we are entering into a contract so this is the contract initiation time that is today and there are two counterparties counterparty a and counterparty b now they both get into a repurchase agreement so basically what happens is uh, this counterparty a will post the collateral in, in in our case it is the government securities worth 100 million dollars to the counterparty b and counterparty b in return will provide cash worth 100 million dollars to this counterparty a all right so let's suppose that at the maturity we have again uh, they they both both these counterparties they meet and uh, as per the repurchase agreement you post the collateral here and then you agree to repurchase it back so basically a will go ahead and will repurchase this hundred million dollar worth of security and in turn this a will pay hundred million dollars of cash which he received here plus he will pay this one million dollar as the interest for this particular period of time as a cost of borrowing from this counterparty B. So this one million dollar of hundred million dollars becomes one percent and this is the implied rate that we call as the repo rates. So repos and basically you post a collateral here and then you repurchase it again by paying the extra amount or the interest on top of what you get okay now moving on to the most important benchmark for many derivative product uh, and that is LIBOR which is known as London interbank offered rate now this is the average interest rate which is estimated by leading banks in London if they were to borrow from each other but before we deep dive into understanding the LIBOR let's first understand what do we mean by interbank offered rate okay we're going to show an example so let's suppose that we have this simple uh, example of understanding the interbank offered rate let's say that the reserve requirement set up by the central bank in our simple example is 10 percent which means that 10 percent of the total capital needs to be kept as reserved or as a buffer in case of any losses that amount can be used up okay so that's the reserve requirement that has been set up now we have these two banks here bank a and bank b and on the other hand they both have hundred dollars in the total capital this is a very simple structure that we are taking and also let's suppose that ten dollars has been set up by the reserve requirement uh, ten dollars has been set up um, has been kept as reserve for bank a and the other ninety dollars has been lent out to the borrowers as loans okay very simple structure on the other hand uh, bank b they also have hundred dollars but they have kept thirty dollars as reserve clearly they have this twenty dollars as the excess reserves okay and this ten dollars is as per the mandate of ten percent okay and the seventy dollars is being lent out as loans to the borrower now let's suppose that one fine day one person walks in and uh, he he withdraws one dollar from this bank a now since 90 percent of the total capital is lent out to loans they have a reserve of ten dollars only so obviously they will go ahead and they will give one dollar out of this reserve okay so their balance of ten dollars will now be reduced to nine dollars here okay and at the same time the total capital also reduces to 99 dollars so far clear but understand now that the reserve requirement has to be 10 percent so they have nine dollars instead and they need to keep 10 percent of 99 which is 9.9 dollars .9. so clearly there is a deficit of 90 cents here so now we have a situation wherein we have one bank who has excess reserve and on the other hand we have a bank who needs this cash so in this logical situation what can be done is that bank b will lend this 90 cent to bank a the reserve requirement will be met and also on the other hand bank b who has excess reserve can also earn some interest rate 
on this particular transaction. So this interest rate that we have here and that bank B will charge that rate is we call this as the LIBOR. So that's the basic conceptual understanding of LIBOR is it's a win win situation for bank B. They have excess reserve, they can earn something on it and bank A needs this much needed cash to maintain the reserve requirement. Okay, so now hopefully you are able to understand the interbank relations between uh, all these different banks. If I if bank A needs the money, maybe bank D, if they have got excess reserve, they can lend out at a certain interest rate. Okay, similarly, the relations will go on and on. And that's how we get these interbank offered rate. Okay, now let's look at the LIBOR calculation, how basically the interest rate are calculated. So we have these 18 banks, they make estimate of the rate at which they can borrow from uh, other banks. So the top four, that is this and the bottom four, these estimates. So for example, these could be very high estimates. So this is discarded from the calculation and these bottom four could be the lowest rate that the banks are quoting. So this is also discarded and this middle range is something that we take the average of all these uh, uh, middle bracket out here and we average it out and that's how uh, we we get our LIBOR for a particular period of time okay so that's how we calculate the LIBOR now even though LIBOR is uh, used very heavily in the derivatives market there has been some uh, manipulation in LIBOR okay for example let's say that if I am a bank and if I'm about to receive a payment uh, in my derivative contract then of course I may have an incentive to actually quote higher rate so that I can profit from my uh, transaction. So and this LIBOR, uh, we are going to deal with this in much detail when we are in FRM level two. Okay, there's a separate chapter for the LIBOR and there are plans to, uh, to, you know, transition from LIBOR to some other rate, which is known as uh, which is one of the proposed rate and that is this uh, secured overnight financing rate. Okay, so let's have a look at this. So this secured overnight financing rate or the SOFR is a one day repo based rate that is derived from actual transactions. So what is happening in the market, the actual transactions that takes place, uh, that, that's how we derive this SOFR. And as I said, we are talking about this in level two, there's a separate chapter for that. But just for now, understand that we have this important uh, derivative benchmark rate, which is known as LIBOR. And there's a replacement for uh, LIBOR and that is this uh, SOFR, okay, secured overnight financing rate. And let me also tell you, like, like we have this LIBOR, we also have uh, MIBOR, which is Mumbai interbank offered rate in India. Okay, so this is also one rate that exists. Then we also have Singapore uh, interbank offered rate. So there are many different uh, interbank offered rates and they are used as a reference rate in many of the derivative uh, products. Okay. All right. So we have already talked about the treasury dates. We've talked about LIBOR, the secure overnight financing rate, as well as the repo rates and the risk free rate. Now we also have another learning objective and that is from 54 and that is describe the OIS, which is overnight indexed swap. And at the same time, we have to distinguish this OIS rates from the LIBOR swap rates. Okay, so before we understand this OIS, the overnight indexed swap, let's first in the basic sense, we understand what what do we mean by swaps? Okay, now let me give you a uh, let me just tell you that we have a separate chapter for swaps. And uh, in that chapter, we are going into much, much detail about uh, more complex swap problems but over here i'm just going to explain uh, in in a very simple terms what what do we mean by a swap uh, all right so let's say that swap is an agreement between these two counterparties for the exchange of cash flows or the interest rates okay so in this particular diagram uh, there's one counterparty here and there's another counterparty here now with the help of this swap they can exchange their cash flows or the interest rate. Okay, so in our simple example, we have party one, he's paying 
fixed to this party two and the fixed interest rate that is paying is 2.5 percent so let's say uh, the contract is worth 1 million dollars at the same time we have this three month swap contract here okay so at the maturity that is here he will pay party one will pay 1 million dollars multiplied by 2.5 percent that is the amount that this party will who's paying fixed will make the payment here and on the other hand party two he will make a floating payment to this counterparty and what do we mean by floating it's it's going to be the LIBOR rate plus the 0.05 percent on top of this LIBOR okay so for example if we have the LIBOR in in this uh, at, at the maturity of three months we have LIBOR uh, let's say we have it as 2.7 then it's going to be floating rate then floating rate will be 2.7 plus 0 0.05 percent okay so this is the amount that party two will make the payment to party one now in this simple example uh, we can clearly see that this party is winning because he's paying less and he's receiving more and of course this party is losing but now moving on to the overnight indexed swap so yes the overnight index swap is also an interest rate swap where a fixed rate is exchanged for a floating rate okay so here we have the illustration for the overnight index swap we have one counterparty here and the other one and they both get into this ois swap and this counterparty is paying fixed rate now just to give you some terminology this fixed rate is called as the ois rate in this ois swap and the counterparty is paying the floating rate now floating is over here it's known as the overnight rates please make a note that we have overnight overnight rates here as compared to the libor here okay the reason for that is very simple uh, the libor is calculated by uh, the 18 banks in london as we have discussed these overnight rates which is for one day only for example if i get into this one month contract then every single day okay each and every single day there will be the overnight rate that will be published okay and these rates will be published generally by the central banks okay so this is something uh, that is a difference between the LIBOR rates and the overnight rates okay okay so they have the central bank will decide what will be the overnight rate for all each of these days and then we take the geometric average to calculate all these different rates one day rate each of these different one day rates uh, we have we take the geometric average of all these rates and we come up with this number right here okay this is just for illustration i've put up a number but it, it could be anything okay depending upon the market rates hopefully you get the gist of the ois now one thing that i want you to pay attention is that uh, when we're talking about the difference between the ois from the libor swap rate i want you to make a note that there is one metric which is libor ois spread and what it says is that if the difference between the libor and the ois if it widens if it goes up okay the difference between these two rates if it goes up then this indicates that the stress level in the market is is very high which essentially means the market conditions are not good okay so this is one indicator that is used when we are comparing the ois and the libor swap rates so and and that's this is something that you need to know for the frm level one exam so with that being said guys we have covered both the learning objectives in the next video i'm going to post some more video to the next learning objectives so make sure that you subscribe to our channel if you haven't subscribed yet thank you so much for your time and you have a great day ahead thank you